Hello and welcome to another episode of the Same Cast Different Day Podcast. I am Marta Rowland. I hope you all are staying safe out there. I hope everything is going to be okay. Um, this has been so much writing and all these other type of things going on. So I hope you all are staying safe. One inspiration behind all this is that uh, Milwaukee Bucks star Giannis under the Kupo and the rest of the Milwaukee Bucks were out protesting and walking in a protest with people to protest Black Lives Matter. So there has been so much inspiration behind all this and I hope that there is a good outcome and I just hope, you know, we can see and live in a better America. So today, my guest, I had such a good time interviewing this person and talking to this person. It it was it was eye opening. I had learned so much from him, and for kicking off our first episode for Pride Month, he is an open LGBT member, and he is running for the 17th District Wisconsin State Assembly. Without further ado, here is Chris Walton. All right, so thank you, Chris, for joining me on this episode of Same Cast Different Day Podcast. I want to thank you for being on. Um, thank you for being the first guest for a part of Pride Month to help us celebrate the LGBTQ plus community. So thank you so much for being a part of this. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. All right, so I've been following your campaign lately, and um, a lot of people don't know what a state what a state assembly do leading up to me doing this interview. They, asked, I mean, they, they didn't know what it was. So can you explain what a state assembly actually does? Sure. So the state assembly and the state of Senate are much like Congress in Washington, D.C., except they meet in Madison and they represent the state. So it's basically just the state level uh, version of Congress. Um, the state assembly would basically be like our members of the House. So where Speaker Nancy Pelosi is, mm-hmm. basically that level here in Madison. So just be a member of the, of the state assembly. I would make bills and write bills and we do the budget and everything for the state. Oh, yeah, I got a lot of questions for you about budgets. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, before we get into that, um, so are you, you're comfortable with talking about openly being outright? Yes. So what difficult, uh, so what difficulties you feel being open and running for office? You know, I haven't really faced a lot of the issues that have come forward. Mm-hmm. Um, I've heard a lot of the horror stories of being out and running, and I, I've just been really lucky that I haven't faced a lot of those issues. Um, you know, I'm currently the chair of the Milwaukee County Democratic Party, and me being the chair of the party, I've been very much so a very visual and openly advocate person working on these campaigns, mm-hmm. uh, being out in the community, people have gotten to know me, to see me on television, paper, and everything. So I think it's already baked in. It's kind of like. For me at this point, it's like, oh my God, he's black. Like, oh my God, he's gay. Yeah, it's that level <laughs> at this point. Hey, people were kind of like, oh yeah, we, we, we knew that already because all the work I've already done. And, you know, it's really, I've been really lucky to come and be involved in politics at this time mm-hmm. because a lot of what I'm dealing with or would have to deal with uh, politically about being openly LGBT mm-hmm. and open, openly gay in, the, in politics it just doesn't exist anymore. The people who most likely wouldn't vote for me because I'm gay are probably the same folks who wouldn't vote for me because I'm a Democrat, probably the same folks who wouldn't vote for me because I'm black. So I've been really lucky, and also it's been really good to have a lot of trailblazers, especially here in Wisconsin. You know, we have people like Senator Tammy Baldwin, who was an yeah. openly lesbian U.S. senator. It was the first U.S. senator, openly LGBT U.S. senator in the United States Congress. That's correct. So she, we've had her, you know, she was a congressman from the Madison area. She was... And now she's a state senator, and she's elected and re-elected statewide. So I think it's a, you know, the people who would the people who would hate me are going to probably hate me for something else. And the people who are very happy to see the fact that they're they'll have a voice at the table to represent them are ecstatic. Everybody I've talked to who and where it has become a talking conversation, it's generally been somebody who was LGBT, and they're like, I can't wait to see you in place in Madison because we don't have anybody representing our voice. That is in true. And, you know, I'm, it's not just to say that I'm only going to represent the LGBT uh, community in Madison, but unlike other people who go to Madison to fight for issues, that is an issue that will 
be right there on my back going in like, hey, I'm here to represent this community and also to talk about this community because I, you know, I share more than one community. I'm an African American. Mm -hmm. I'm gay. I'm from the city of Milwaukee. And all three of those are walking in that building on day one with me. And it'll be the first time any, any of those three issues have all walked in together. Right. So are you running, is it the 17th district or the 7th district that you're running for? The 17th. 17th this was district. formerly David Crowley's. So, mm-hmm. so are you like, um, like the Wassa area? Because I, I know, I think I read like part of, is that part of Iowa, the Wassa area, like more southwest of Wisconsin, right? Oh, no, 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 no. So that's, the, so the 7th Congressional District. Okay. That's up in uh, the Wausau, up in northwestern Wisconsin. Oh, okay. So my district, my district, so that's a fed, that's federal. Okay. So that's the, that, but that would basically be what I'm running for on the federal level. Okay. Uh, on a on a state level, I'm running for state assembly. So I'll be representing uh, an area of west, the west central area of Milwaukee, which is basically like 35th and Capitol to about 92nd and Capitol. It mm-hmm. goes up to Hampton and it goes all the way down like North Avenue and it comes up like Lisbon. So like west central Milwaukee. Okay. So so speaking of that area, so. One of the uh, things I had wanted to talk to you about was far as like budgeting. Um, so I think this is kind of a good idea. It's, so I see a lot of seniors. They work a, a lot during their lifetime. I know the house, like the state is vote on like property tax and like tax control and all that kind of stuff and budgeting. But I see a lot of like our elderly people who are on fixed incomes and can they're barely uh, they don't get uh, you know like energy assistance. They don't get food stamps and they living on this twelve hundred dollars a month. And still, and trying to live in their own houses at the same time and pay you no know, property tax. So, do you think yeah. that is there is there possibly a way that we can like help them or come up with some type of uh, plan to help them or pass a bill to help them? There are a couple of different options that I've been uh, really starting to do more researching on uh, uh-huh. about that question because a couple of people have actually asked me about that. And I know there are some states that don't charge uh, property taxes to people over a certain age. Which of course would truly, truly help a lot of folks. Yeah. Um, especially dealing with issues like gentrification in a lot of these neighborhoods where the older people leave and then new people come in and then they start raising the property values on everybody else. Yeah. Uh, so there are a lot of different options that I would be very interested in seeing how we can make that work for here in Wisconsin. Um, but property taxes is definitely something that the state assembly would vote for and all budgets in the state. And in our state legislature start in the assembly, then they go to the Senate, then we do our joint finance committee, and we put a budget together, then we would send it to Governor Evers, and he would sign, or he would veto, or he would partial veto, and do, you know, mm-hmm. move some things around to make it better. Um, that's what happened last time, well, two years ago, well, it will be two years ago next year, uh, when we passed the last budget. Governor Evers uh, changed around some of the budget items that the state legislature put in place. Because the current state legislature is a Republican majority in the Assembly and in the Senate. So there were a lot of things that they put forward in the budget that Governor Evers just didn't agree with and that mm-hmm. members of the Democratic Party did not ex- agree with either, including myself. So there would probably be some budget vetoes that the governor would put in place, but we have to make sure that we have, hopefully, ne- when the next budget comes up next year, uh, mm-hmm. we'll have a Democratic majority and I'll be a part of the Democratic majority. But if not, hopefully we can maintain... Um, Governor Evers' veto so that Republicans aren't just passing through legislation and passing through things in the budget that will only hurt uh, a lot of the people because of course next year we're looking at we're going to have to fix this budget hole that got blown in this year due yeah. to the coronavirus and the economy collapsing. That's correct. So we're going to have a lot of very very difficult votes. You know, Republicans, the first thing they want to do is start slashing and cutting and burning education and health care and road spending and all this kind of thing. They first thing their first idea is to cut, cut, cut. Yeah. And then offer a property tax relief cut check for a hundred dollars after they've cut everything out from under you. I will not support a budget that does that. I absolutely will not. As a matter of fact, I want to go to Madison to actually grow the budget. And that and by that I mean we need to bring in the Obamacare expansion, which is a whole uh, almost a billion dollars worth of money that the state of Wisconsin pays into the federal government every year, but the state of Wisconsin will not accept this money back. This is our money. We could be giving people health care insurance. Right. But they won't take this money. Wow, that's crazy. I did not know that. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, wow. Yeah, we need somebody to go there and fight for that change. <laughs> so, <laughs> so speaking of, like, uh, the Republicans passing, because there's been a lot of stuff that they've been passing that I haven't necessarily agreed with myself, because the house that I live in, you know, me, me and my brother and my mom, we all own the house together. And, like, every uh-huh. year I've been realizing, like, I'm paying more and more to live in this part, in a certain part of the city. And yet, with right. the money that we're paying in, we're not seeing no return on that. Right. And and that's, that's you're going right down my policy platform, actually. So the reason that is is the fact that, so Milwaukee creates 30% of the state of Wisconsin's budget. Mm-hmm. Even though if you listen to people, the Republicans in Madison, they'll say Milwaukee does nothing but drain the state of Wisconsin. We create a third of the budget. And we send all of our money to Madison. Now, when it comes time to return that money and pay, you know, so we can rebuild our roads and fix our lead laterals and make sure our community is put together, we maybe get a tenth of what we send. Oh, wow. And that's not okay. It's that's not. what our roads look like. Now. They look. That's why we have the infrastructure issues that we have. So that's one of my platform issues that I want to go and work on our city's infrastructure. But we're going to have to get our fair share of our money back from the state of Wisconsin. We put more into the pot than we give out. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. Even on a federal level, Wisconsin puts more money into the pot than we get back from the federal government. I don't know what it is about the Republicans in Wisconsin, but they don't like they like to say they're protecting our tax dollars. Mm -hmm. But they like to spend more of our give more of our tax dollars away and not take our money back. So I want to go and actually get our money back from the federal government, which is expanding Obamacare here in the state of Wisconsin. And then I want to go get that money back from Madison and take that back to Milwaukee so we can actually get our fair share of our shared revenue and spend that on putting our roads back together. Because I'm personally, you know, I was out marching uh, today with some of the protests and mm-hmm. I fell in two potholes. What? <laughs> so I'm like, if I'm falling on foot in the potholes, I can only imagine what these cars are doing. Right. So I'm uh, I, I am a pothole <laughs> fanatic right now because I've hit two of them while on foot. So we got to fix this. <laughs> y- yes, cause it's, it's some roads that I don't been on around here lately. That's just been ridiculous. It's like literally driving on a dirt road. It's bad. I, it is horrible. I was t- I was telling some folks when we were out knocking on doors, I was like, you know, basically, if you are qualified to drive on the street in Milwaukee, you are qualified to drive on a monkey. Because it's the same amount of craters. And pop, <laughs> it's, just, it's insane. Right. It's just insane. We can't. We cannot have a from Milwaukee to be the major city that it is. We cannot allow our infrastructure to look like this and still claim to be a major city. Right. We cannot allow the fact that there are no there's no movie theaters on the north side of Milwaukee. There are no malls within the city of Milwaukee. We are missing major infrastructure and economic development and jobs that this city should have, but we just don't have it. And we got to send somebody, we got to send, you know, our delegation is doing the best they can. Right. But they're in a minority. So we got to make sure we keep the government, we got to make sure we don't allow the Republicans to get super majorities in the state legislature. We got to make sure we keep uh, sending good people to Madison to fight the bad people because there's a lot more of them right now. Hopefully this November we'll get the majority back and then we can start to turn this situation around. Because just imagine if Governor Walker had got reelected, where we'd be right now. (laughs) Uh-huh. So we yeah. are get that one person in. Now we got to get some people to back him up, and that's what I want to go and do myself. I want to yeah. go make sure we back up Tony Evers. Yeah, and um, on a previous podcast I had did, I had I had I tried to educate so much. It's a lot of young voters who do not go vote and don't and don't really and when they do go vote, they don't know really really what they're doing. And then a lot of them don't know their importance right. to other votes. Like I tell them, no matter what the election is, you have to vote because. Uh, my aunt is one of those people who she feel like she only should vote for president. And I said, you know, you, you, you need to vote for uh-huh. the president because on, the president don't make the bills. The president only signs bills and veto bills, and that's all he do. He's just a spokesman for this country. Right. And so you got to vote for all your other local governments just so, you know, it, it's your local people lets the people know in Washington know, like, hey, we need to do this. Right. And we can't do that if you're not voting for them people. And you won't see change if you don't vote for them people. So, exactly. yeah, that's been one of my issues with the younger folks. I know so many people who just do not go vote. And that, that bothers me so much, but complain about how things are. Our government system is basically like a diamond. Um, or better yet, I put it this way. Our government system is basically like a pyramid. The mm-hmm. president is literally the top of the pyramid. Right. But you got a lot of government as you go down 
and that's when you start to see more and more people that are getting closer and closer to you. Because at the base of that pyramid is the people. Our government does not exist without the will of the people. Right. You are the ones who vote and put us in in place. You are the ones who hold us accountable. And if we're not doing what you're, we're supposed to be doing, you're the ones that take us out. Right. That is so true. So another thing I had wanted to talk to you about was, um, to me, the, the Republicans have list, lifted the cost of living so high in Milwaukee that it's ridiculous. And a lot of the jobs here don't really reflect the cost of living that's going on here. So what is your uh, you know, thought on that? So I support the raising of the minimum wage. I would support raising it to $15 an hour so that we can actually start to really push back on that ability to live without... You know, I had to work three jobs and take care of my kids and go to school. I don't even get to sleep. No one sleep anymore. That's not that right. important, apparently. Um, you know, folks need to have the ability. If I'm working 40 hours a week, I should be able to go home and have a home and be able to take care of my family. Right. You know, my family moved up here from here Crow South during the 1950s because they couldn't find good paying jobs and opportunity to build a life for themselves and their children. Mm-hmm. So when they moved up here, they found those jobs that my grandparents met, and they got married, and they had a family, and they gave that opportunity to my parents. And my parents had good living wage, family-sustaining jobs. You know, my mom uh, works for the Milwaukee County Transit. My dad was a factory worker, but he was he is also a veteran from the U.S. Army. And so they both had great jobs that were, allowed them to take care of my sister and I and give us the opportunities to go forward and do what we need to do. And that's how I ended up becoming one of the first people I became one of the first people in my generation to graduate from college because mm-hmm. my parents had the, had the ability to, excuse me, they had the mm-hmm. ability to provide for me and my sister. And we were able to take advantage of that opportunity. And we have to create those jobs. That is the quickest way to stabilize the city of Milwaukee, to create that educational base and that financial base to grow the city of Milwaukee and make it a better place. But if we don't do that, we're going to continue this vicious cycle of seeing poverty and segregation and people not able to just get up. They can't get up when everything is weighing down on them. One thing Republicans always say is we're going to give you, you know, we want you to pick yourself up by your own bootstraps. Mm-hmm. People don't even, we don't, they don't even have boots. <laughs> That's true. There are no straps to put on nothing. You gotta, we got to fix the systemic problems that we have in this country. For us to be the richest country on earth, we have a lot of people in poverty that just should not be. And the, pro- the fixes for these problems are fairly simple if we do what we're supposed to do. But we have a situation where the- we have one party that is willing to work on these issues, and we have another party that's saying just no. Right. That is true. So, like, so one of the things I have noticed is that, f- for me, I've noticed that in the city of Milwaukee alone, it seems like it costs more to live in the city of Milwaukee than it say would be to like Greenfield or Oak Creek and all these other places that are, you know, surrounding the city of Milwaukee or even Waukesha or Menominee Falls, which, which bothers me a lot because like, I noticed like we're the only city in Milwaukee in the state that still has pay over a hundred dollars a month just to put a sticker on our car, which I think is far ridiculous. And, you know, I noticed that like for me, like I don't even have any kids, but I noticed that every year the property on my property tax, the school tax has gone up, but yet they have closed every, nearly every major public school by my house. That's, and, and that goes back into our share, the shared revenue. Yeah. All this money that we're bringing in, we have to bring in more money on top of that just to break even. That's why we have to put that wheel tax in place so we can keep our public transportation systems up and running and keep our roads funded. Because the money that should be coming back to us from Madison, it's not coming back. So we have to put another tax on top of that so we can even just maintain things as they are without them falling further behind. And that, and it's, and it, so like the other counties, they don't have no other, they don't have no obligation to pay no wheel tax or nothing like that. Just the city of Milwaukee? That's because they're getting their money back. And they're getting more of their money back. Wow. So you and just, another issue that happens is it usually... If you usually when you go, you you've been in Chicago, mm-hmm. our our southern suburb. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. When you go to Chicago, it's always more expensive. Bigger cities are just more expensive. That's just the natural cost curve. Mm-hmm. Because there's more people there, there's more money going there, more jobs and stuff. It's always more expensive in the city. Right. Um, 
but as you go further out into the rural areas, of course, prices come down. Mm-hmm. And, you know, look at Milwaukee, but in Chicago, it's like, oh, I'd rather live in Milwaukee. That's um, true. The financial, that financial issue is just, that that's one of those just cost of living things that happen. But we can make things work better. We don't have to have just an intense, we don't have to be San Francisco. Now, if you want to see a city that has a lot of uh, extremely high cost of living, San Francisco, New York, D.C. Yeah, I read about those. They make Milwaukee look like we all just living in just in palatial estates and not paying nothing. Yeah. Because I think in San Francisco, for even a studio apartment, I think they're paying up to at least two two thousand to twenty five hundred dollars a month just for a studio yeah. apartment. So, yeah, I understand their I understand their pain over there. <laughs> and if you pay that in Milwaukee, you have a home. Right. Land, you have a home with land around it, and you own this. That is true. And they're paying that for a studio in a corner with no window. <laughs> that is that is very true. So I wanted to uh, speak on. So you uh, graduated for polit- political science, correct? Yes. So, what made you go towards? We that? gave it away. <laughs> So I have to I have to do my research. So a lot of people don't know. So when I do interviews, I, I do a lot of research. So I went through your LinkedIn and everything. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I did my research. <laughs> so hey, that's good. That's good. <laughs> so yeah, still. So you graduated from um, Mississippi State, correct? And you majored in polit- studying political science. Not, not Ole Miss. Not Ole Miss. That is a fight that happens all the time. What for the listeners? For the listeners, Old Miss is our rival school. So there's Old Miss of that's from Oxford, Mississippi, and Mississippi State University. <laughs> this is Starkville, and so yeah, it, 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 I had to make sure to put that point there because people will say, oh, "Oh, is that Old Miss?" No, it is not Old Miss. <laughs> oh my god, we are not nearly as racist. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> so what made you go into studying uh, political political science? Oh, uh, political science, yeah. So, since I was a little boy, um, I fell in love with the Kennedys when I was nine years old. Mm-hmm. My third grade teachers knew I loved reading, I loved history, and just being very interactive within the class and trying to be a leader in the class. And she recommended, you know, hey, read this book, Tr- uh, check it out, see what you think. And I just became totally engrossed with JFK. Mm. Just, I, as a matter of fact, I still have the book. I went and found the book on Amazon. Oh, wow. And I have it, and this is a book that I will have forever because this is the book that inspired me to want to go into public service. And, yeah. and depending on how you look at my politics, it, I, I either snowball downhill or run uphill from falling in love with Kennedys from there. And of course, you know, life as I got older and with the high school, I was president of my high school class. And um, when it came time to go to college, it was like, well, well we don't even have to ask Chris what he's going to go to college for. <laughs> Clearly, he's going to go for political science. Like, well, yeah, it, it only makes sense. I definitely wasn't going to go for biology. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just a natural, it was the natural progression. Of course, I, and then when I got down there to Mississippi State, I picked up uh, my minors in history, which, of course, I lo- I've always loved history, and African-American studies because I wanted to know more about my own personal history mm-hmm. as opposed to just learning American history. Right. And, you know, it all worked out perfectly. Sorry, I had to fix my audio for a second. Okay. Good. <laughs> so that's that's interesting that the Kennedys is what got you started, which a lot of people, I, I noticed that when a lot of younger people who are going into politics, they always look back at John F. Kennedy as their inspiration. And I find it, I find it crazy, but yet shocking most of the time. Right. <laughs> Especially with the younger it's people. It's because, you know. Go ahead. For me, it was well, maybe and it, because it was a children's biography. They don't really tell you all of the extra stuff that comes with the kids. Right. Um, but we'll, we'll just gloss over that part. You'll, you'll figure it out when you get a little older. <laughs> um, but it was his story. You know, he was very sickly as a kid, and he. I remember when I was because I was an only child at that point. I um, and just really falling in love with reading and getting just deeply involved in that. And that was one of the things he used to do because he was very sickly as a kid, which is mm-hmm. read constantly. And for me, it was like a connecting point. Like, oh yeah, he liked to read. I like to read. Let's, let's 
there's a common point. And reading about the stuff that he done, of course, this was again, this was a children's biography, so they talked about things at probably the thirty thousand foot level of him creating the Peace Corps and starting the race to the moon and you know, all of these things for me, it was like I, I appreciate that. If he could do that mm-hmm. and he was just a, a kid reading a book like me, I could do it. Right. Now of course I didn't realize at the time his family was multimillionaires, billionaires <laughs> almost and uh, <laughs> you know, his dad was an ambassador, so it was a little bit different. You know, we're I'm the Waltons. Uh, we the Waltons who shop at Walmart, not the Waltons who own Walmart. <laughs> so I wasn't going to be starting that uh, journey from that far ahead. Right. But it just inspired me to want to do. You know, I can do these things. I can learn. I can start going down this path, and hopefully one day I could be in a book. Somebody, some other little kid is reading about. It, it was like maybe I can inspire, inspire them. And so that was that's the hope. Um, I could feel your I think inspiration. They, I think that's the thing about the they give hope. I could feel your inspiration from here. <laughs> I was just like, oh, like, oh man, we got to get this guy in office. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I mean, because I'm gonna sit here listening and you know, to and you're very. One thing that it, is really interesting about that too, uh-huh. because falling in love with the Kennedys, and then being alive and working on the Obama campaigns, mm-hmm. it's like a perfect time for me to connect with that young, that young youthful movement from then to coming now and it's an African American like somebody who looks like me and actually comes from a background like I came from mm-hmm. and seeing his white kids is like okay I really can do this now yes you know I, 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 and of course at this point I'm a little older so I understand you know I'm not gonna be I can't just walk out and be president one day but I could raise you know I could begin to do this work and do great work for the community and serve the people. And the people will reward me because I worked hard for them. And to, I'll never forget that night that the Obamas walked out there on that stage, that election night, and it was like, wow, we actually did it. This is the second, this is the second coming of the Kennedys. Because you look at them, they're just glamorous people. Mm-hmm. I don't know how yes. they just naturally always have this just beautiful <laughs> glow about them. But this was this was it, and it was like, okay, I've read about it. Now I'm seeing it. I'm doing it. Let's go. That's true. Cause like just just speaking with you, I can feel the passion for it. And I don't, it's not a lot of people that don't have the passion like you do that I'm hearing. Yeah. Cause a lot of people they get up there and they ask us for our votes, but sound so bland with it. Like just, you know, but you don't hear them speak with the passion. Yeah. So this this is this is a life goal for me. I I, I made a decision at a very early age. I wanted to serve people. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, of course, that made me a little perpetually boring as a younger adult. But, you know, this is the sacrifices you make for the people. Boring is good <laughs> to me. Boring can be good. <laughs> I, I've definitely seen some people who are a lot more interesting. And, boy, they are a lot more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm doing this for the greater good. See, yeah, that's good. Cause like I said, there's a lot of people out here who do it just for the money. And it's nice to see somebody who actually has a passion and who, like, especially around our age group, we almost around the same age group. So I think he graduated high school like two years before I did. So so we almost around the same age group. We, we won't talk about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's nice to see somebody within our age group who has that passion and who has been through our experience, whether... You know, even for the LGBT part of your, you know, of your life and everything. And, you know, to see somebody who has gone through our experiences and then going out into the political world and putting those experience into, you know, to help us, it, it shows. And I, I, I love it. Yeah, it is. It's an it's an honor to step out there on that stage and people actually cheer for you and support you is it's humbling. You know, it's like, I'm actually doing this. And I really, and it's in, it's in just energizing. I walk on that stage sometimes and it's like, all right, here we go. And then the people start applauding or you're, you're giving your speech and people are listening and they're really getting into it. And it, the more the, the more the crowd is into it, the more mm-hmm. you get into it. Right. And it makes the speech that much better. And it's like, yeah, this is what I needed right here. <laughs> and I just, I, I'll finish a speech and I'll come off the stage and I'm like I can go run across, run across country right now on foot because I'm ready to go <laughs> and it's just 
it's that connecting point. I've always just wanted to help. Mm-hmm. And, you know, some people t- will tag and say, well, you're too ambitious. You want to be involved in politics. Well, you know what? Yeah, I'm ambitious. But that's what we I'm need. I'm supposed to be ambitious. Yes. Right. My parents didn't my parents didn't raise me to be a shrinking wallflower. And they raised me to one do oh it's a car flying by they need a muffler. Um they, my parents raised me to go out there, give your best, and do the job people are asking you to do. Right. And if the opportunity arises to continue on down that path and continue to do your best and give and just give yourself to the world and make the world a better place, then you are here for a reason. Right. You are here to do this. And if you're not going to do this, there is no reason for you to be here because you're wasting your talents that you were given to right. help others. It's crazy. So, I think I remember seeing you on TV a few months ago. This is way before I even started the podcast. And at that time, my spark was out. I had didn't know what I was going to do in my life. I didn't have no plans, you know. Um, I did YouTube before, but then like that spark went out. It was like I was I wasn't me, and I feel like I wasn't being the real me to with people, and I feel like I was being fake to just to get you know the views and everything. So you know, I started this podcast, and then the spark came back, and you know, like I'm on this podcast, I'm able to be me. And I'm able to talk to people like you now. It's crazy now seeing now talking to you now compared to seeing you on TV months ago. It was like I never would have thought that this would have been happening <laughs> at this moment. But when you walk in the thing you're supposed to do, there's no stopping. That is true. When you get where you supposed when you get where you're supposed to be, you will be there. Right. Because talking used to like like for my listeners, for the listeners that's out there, you know, if you having self doubt right now, this is a good example right here. You know when. You just got to do it. And you when you have the passion for it, you just have to do it and go for it. Yeah. And, I, I'm, I'm, yeah. and I'm liking every minute of this right now. Like, I'm on the bandwagon now. <laughs> <laughs> I am on the bandwagon. I'm kind of upset that you don't represent the area that I live in. But... <laughs> I'll make sure to get you a campaign sign. <laughs> I, 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 I will put it in my yard still, to be honest. I really will. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> So I want to talk to you a little bit more about you. So it says that you work for the yeah. state commission, um, like the, the state United States Commission of Civil Rights. Can you explain, explain what that is? So uh, back in 1957, President Eisenhower at the time put together, uh, along with the, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1957, um, a presidential commission where all 50 states, well, 48 states at that time, had to have um, just commission on the issues regarding civil rights in those different states. Um, and I was recently offered the position, uh, back in, what was that day? But that was like 2019, mm-hmm. uh, to be a commissioner for, to represent the state of Wisconsin to the Wisconsin, uh, civil rights commission. Mm-hmm. And so basically we just investigate, you know, we monitor and investigate different things that'll happen right now. Of course, I, as you can imagine, the hottest topic <laughs> with the commission <laughs> right now would be, uh, George Floyd and the situation, the unfortunate situation up in Minneapolis and all of the the different unrest that's happening around the country now because of that situation. You see, I was going to ask you about that later, but I guess we can talk on it now. <laughs> about the... Uh... Which way you want to go with that? Because <laughs> <laughs> I, have, cause I have wanted to talk about the whole George uh, Floyd situation. Well, mostly, wait, well, mostly here what's been going on locally because to be honest... Last night was the first time I felt like I lived in Compton. So a helicopter flew over my house last night with the spotlight and everything shining. Like I felt like I was in Compton for real. And with everything going on, this has just felt so unreal to me. Yeah. And it is it's an unfortunate situation, you know. Sadly there are people and, and I just yeah, hear me out, folks. On, uh, listen on the podcast. There are some good police officers. I agree with you. I have family officers in the police force, but there are people in our police force who should not be in our police force, and they are bad actors, and they are not in good faith, and they do not understand the communities that they are supposed to be protecting and serving, and that is why we have these situations continuously 
coming forward. And it's not that these are new situations, they're just mm-hmm. recorded situations. Right. You know, I'm, I'm lucky. I, I'm lucky in a lot of ways. I've never personally faced a situation where I have had to face the police just because I am black. Yeah, I agree with sadly, you. Sadly, everything I've, sadly, every interaction I've ever had with the police and me inside of a car has been my fault. <laughs> <laughs> That's not everybody. Right. You know, I have friends and family who have been caught driving while black. And the fact that they're driving while black is a thing, it's a damn shame. Right. And, you know, police brutality should not exist. Right. It should. Because their job, which we are paying them to do, is to protect and serve us. That's correct. Not kill us. That is correct. And it's sad that this keeps happening. And we have to fix this. We absolutely have to fix this. I'm very pleased that the four officers were fired in Minneapolis. Mm-hmm. I'm happy. I'm happy that the man who was the lead has not been arrested and charged. But those other three gentlemen need to be arrested and charged as well. I we agree need with to you. fully. The case needs to go forward. They need to be tried. Personally, I feel they need to be convicted, and we need to change the entire culture of mm-hmm. the American police force. Because we don't have these issues in other countries. We don't. We don't. Police in other countries, they show up. You know, I saw a, there was a meme on Facebook. Like, have you ever noticed how American police cars look versus European police cars? American police cars, they usually try to get them to be to fade in to other cars so you don't notice them. That are black and white, so you can't necessarily see them at night. You're correct. <laughs> now in Europe, they're highlighter yellow. Yes, they are. <laughs> they had an annoying wee 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 Right. Sound. You know that's the police. Right. Why do our why are our police hidden? If their job is to serve and protect, why are they hiding from us? Mm-hmm. We need to change that. Yeah, I've seen car police cars like I saw a Ford Focus police car. It had a regular Wisconsin plate on it. It didn't have like an official state plate plate on it, nothing. And it had the lights on like the blue blue red lights and everything on there. Right. Uh, that was my first time seeing it. I couldn't believe it. Like you going that right. far to catch somebody? Like if you got to go that far, then you're not doing your job very well, for my in my personal opinion. We our police force needs to be wholesale changed. Yeah. There's a cultural change that needs to happen in our police force. Uh, I I still regret and I resent and I'll do what I can to, to fix what the state supreme court did when they threw out the home the home rule uh, acts where if you work for the city. You have to live in the city. Oh, yeah, they need to go back they to that. They should never remove that. They should never remove that. I think we should make it as... That should be put back in place. Mm-hmm. I would also like to see for our police departments to actually live in Milwaukee and look like Milwaukee. Right. You know, other cities have some diversity in their police departments. They have LG, openly LGBT. You know, if you've been to Philly, the Philly has a gayborhood. Their police cars are literally rainbow colored in the gayborhood. What? Yeah. I've been to Philly, yeah, but I've never been in that part of Philly. I highly recommend visiting Philly. But yeah, the police car is, the police car is gay. That's how gay <laughs> the police department is in that area. So they make sure, they actually take the time to reach out and become part of the community. Right. We have to fix that. We have to, because otherwise they can't do their job because they can't protect and serve us because they're, one, trying to protect themselves and serve themselves. Mm-hmm. And that's not a Right. They can't. We can't have our police departments taking our taxpayer money from the city of Milwaukee and going to get a home in New Berlin. That is correct. You need to take that money and buy a home in Milwaukee and live in Milwaukee and police your community. And if you do not want to be a police officer in Milwaukee because you have to live in Milwaukee, we can find someone else in Milwaukee who does want that job. I agree with you totally, one hundred percent on that. Because, um, because that was going to lead me to like. Do you think that this is something that we're going to be recovered from, especially with so the thing that has been bothering me the most? Like, um, I understand that people are angry and they're upset, but what I've been noticing is that people are literally, you know, trashing their own communities. They have burned down stores. Like, I commend the young man I saw. Um, he was on his Facebook Live, I believe, Friday night, going into Saturday morning, and he was recording oh, down on. Um, what is that street? King Drive and Locust, the Walgreens. And he went in there and put the fire out, saying he lived in his community. You know, this is my community. You guys should be doing this. And he went and put the fire out that was going on inside the Walmart. I mean, the Walgreens. Right. 
So, do you think this is something that, you know, we can recover from, especially with the pandemic? Like, do you think the black-owned stores will be able to recover from this? Because they were already shut down for two months. And then now with this happening, do you think that this is something we can recover from? We got some difficult days ahead. And that's just, that's just where we are right now in the United States. We have to figure out how we're going to deal with this pandemic, which is killing especially here in the city of Milwaukee, mostly African-Americans mm-hmm. and minorities. We have to figure out how we are going to protect those very same people who are going through an already terrible situation are now having that exacerbated by the fact that the police are a threat as opposed to being the first responders that they're supposed to be. Right. We have to fix that. And when people are, res- people are responding right now out of anger, Mm-hmm. And we know hurt, hurt people hurt people. Right. We need to figure out a way how we can tamp down this anger. Because one, it's not coming from the top of the pyramid anymore because we have basically a five-year-old with a Twitter account <laughs> tweeting every day. It's just the stupidest things I've ever seen in my life coming yeah. from the White House. But we don't, have, we don't have a person who's willing to actually do the job right now as president. So we have to do it on our own. We need leaders in place who will actually respond to the community, who are listening to the community. I saw Vice President Biden today, who was the Democratic nominee, actually out in Wilmington, Delaware, his hometown, Mm -hmm. walking around in the area where the protests were taking place and listening to people. Listening. Not saying anything, just listening. Right. We need leaders to do that. We don't have that currently. We don't. And it, it shows. This is it what is. this is what happens. I saw on Twitter today. I was like, you, "When you hire a clown, expect the circus," and that's what we've gotten the last three years and four. This last four years, we can't do this anymore. Four more years of this will not. We will not exist. Right. Because and we need to make sure that we reach out. One thing that I want to do, especially around economic development, mm-hmm. with these business, and trying to make sure we bring back these black businesses and any of these businesses that have been damaged. Mm-hmm. We need to make sure that we're putting the state of Wisconsin is living up to its obligations and fulfilling its minority business owner contracts and make sure all of the people who are looking to get those contracts know they are there. They have access to them, they have the assistance to apply for them and get those grants and we get, get them up and stable. We right. have to, in order for one of the biggest things that caused a lot of the problems here in Milwaukee is the black middle class in Milwaukee does not exist. It's like it like it used to exist mm-hmm. and like it exists in other places. If you look at a, the black community in D.C. or Atlanta or uh, Dallas and Houston, they have black middle classes. Milwaukee doesn't have a black middle class, at least it, um, on par with those, and it's, it's shrinking by the day. We have to make sure we can get those small business owners, those small black business owners up and on their feet and growing a base. Otherwise, we're saying otherwise. We're living in otherwise right now. Right. And we have to fix that. We have to. That is the only way this city will grow and thrive again. Yeah, I I, I said that. And it's like, I like that you hit on the middle class because I'm one of those people who kind of consider myself to be a middle class like one of the things i have noticed uh for me personally you know by me being so i most likely you know when i do my taxes i have to do the whole single thing or whatever so what i've been noticing is that i'm paying so much into taxes and not getting nothing in return but at the same at the same time it's like i don't qualify to get any um like government assistance but yet, I, but yet, at the same time, I don't quite make enough money to where um, people should say be comfortable and be able to live a comfortable right. life. And that's something right. that I've been noticing within the city of Milwaukee. And when I talk to a lot of the, a lot of people, like uh, that's when in that same situation, they feel the same way. Like for those for those for those who are single and have to be you no know, as far as anything tax wise, you know, it's it's it's. It bothers us, but yet it bothers us. Like we, we're grateful to be in a position that we are, but at the same time, it bothers us because we see so many people who, you know, who don't. I'm not. I don't, I don't know how to say this without kind of bashing people. <laughs> like I see so many people who take advantage of the system, 
And they, right. they like, I see people who will cut their work hours to receive certain benefits. And, right. and, you know, and, those, and stuff like that. So it's like, it bothers me because I can't, you know, like, as much as some middle class people need their help, that help is just not there for us. Like, we want to be able to buy homes and do the, do all these other things, but yet we don't qualify for a lot of these programs because we're not low income. Like, they quick to help a low income person purchase a home than it is for a middle class person who are paying who is paying for everything out of pocket and can use right. that support so let me so check this out i mean because i i know that one that i've heard that complaint before now think about this if you are making between two jobs 15 dollars an hour mm-hmm. but before but you're just working those two jobs, and you're just barely put, putting along. You work, matter of fact, you're working at Walmart, mm-hmm. and you're just barely making along. But because you work at Walmart, you're not making enough, and you get food stamps, and you get free daycare, and you get all those free health care benefits and everything because you don't make enough. Mm-hmm. That's why we need to raise the minimum wage. But the problem with that also comes is once you hit that barrier and you start making more money, mm-hmm. and you're out that part area where you get those benefits, you basically get knocked back down to where you started from. Yeah. Because now you have to pay for that daycare. You have to pay for those health care benefits. Mm-hmm. You have to pay for all these things, these these benefits and entitlements that you get mm-hmm. from when you were low income that you no longer get now. Yeah. So we have to figure out a way to balance that. We can't let people starve in the streets. That's correct. We can, we are a twenty first century society. We're the richest, most powerful nation on earth and we need to act like it. At the same time, we need to figure out how do we give people that that hand up, but mm-hmm. also don't crush them when they finally do get back on their feet. Right. You know, when, when you go off to school, your parents don't say, okay, bye. Mm-hmm. They don't push you just out the door and then that's just it. Because, I don't know about you, I would have fell into, I fell into a black hole. <laughs> Yeah. Because I can't afford to fend for myself just yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. I, it's like being book smart versus street smart. I have the idea of what I'm supposed to do. Right. But I've never put it in practice. So right. now that I'm putting it in practice, I'm falling further and further behind, which is also a problem that a lot of the people in the African American community face, especially from the middle, who are people who grew up middle class, mm-hmm. like yourself and I. People like us grow up. We ha- we don't have everything given to us. We we have black parents. We know you know how that go. Right. But, <laughs> but you get out there with all that knowledge and all of that expertise, and, and you're ready to go into the world. Then you get hit with thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars worth of student loan debt, mm-hmm. which when you graduate, you're expected to pay. That's with correct. that job, and you're supposed to get this job that you're supposed to have ten years of experience on already to mm-hmm. get to this job. But you just graduated from college. Now you still owe fifty thousand dollars in debt. That's correct. You are working at Starbucks or Walmart and trying to get yourself up off your feet because you know you know how to do this. You were you have the knowledge base of how to do this, but you can't get further because now you're falling further and further behind. And there was a report on on African American middle on the African American middle class of people who grow up in the middle class, start out and fall back to where they started from, basically, mm-hmm. and have to work their lives to get back to where their parents were when they became adults for mm-hmm. their kids. Then their kids graduate and fall right back down to that hole. Yep. So it's like you have to spend your entire life working to get out of the hole for the next generation, and then they fall back into the hole. Mm-hmm. And it's just a cycle of never-ending. People can't get ahead. So we have to figure out uh, it made me think of that. Uh, I don't know if you were a Family Guy fan. Yeah. Uh, they were playing a board game of uh, being black. And it was like, yeah, you don't, you never win the game. You just do a little bit better every time. Yeah. <laughs> we got to do a little bit better than that. <laughs> we yeah. can't keep just doing a little bit better every time. We got to do better. Right. And we have to have the government, the number one job of the government is protecting citizens, mm-hmm. be it from a threat from another country or from, um, from, dirty water they drink or filthy air mm-hmm. or hunger that is the government's number one job is to protect its citizens right and our government right now and honestly our government for the long time has not been doing its job 
That is now, correct. When, you, when it's time to go to war, you can call on the United States. We will be Johnny on the spot with every bomb, gun, boat, and bullet <laughs> that we can put together, and we'll be ready to go. That and we're going to win this, because that's what we do. Right. If we know nothing, we know how to win a war. Mm-hmm. We get into a situation like now, where we're facing a pandemic, we fall apart. Yes. That's got to change. We have to have a government that is proactive, that is learning from the mistakes of the past and present, and fixing it so when these things happen in the future, ready. Right. And we had that in place, but, you know, Cittolini wasn't exactly <laughs> thinking it was a good idea. Right. Like, this isn't that important. We haven't, we haven't had a pandemic in over 100 years. Well, yeah, these usually are 100 year events. Oh, well, it's been over 100 years and that hasn't happened. Okay. It's, it's, Here we go now. It's crazy because I saw the video on, I don't know if it was on Twitter or Facebook, but I saw the video from a few years ago where Obama said this was coming and had a, um, like a team, like a team put together to who had this thing, you know, planned out to where, how it was going to be handled so that when it did hit, it wouldn't hit us the way how it's hitting us now. And when Trump got in office, he dismantled this whole team. So it makes me like really think like I wonder and a lot of these voters, especially with November coming up, it should really have them thinking like, oh, my God, what did I do by putting this man in office? Because he is not thinking about our safety first. Donald Trump has never been a person who has cared about anybody else other than his, his personal tanning stylist, his toupee <laughs> and himself. That That is true. And, you know, I don't, you know, there are people who, when he first got elected, well, well, maybe this will be the moment he becomes more, he will become, you know, you grow and become president. No, you mm-hmm. don't grow to become a president. You are, you are the president now. Right. We're all looking to you to make the decisions, good, bad, or indifferent. Right. That is your job, which you ran for. Right. And you are incapable of doing that job. And you have shown this while running, before, you've shown this before running, you've shown mm-hmm. this while running. And now, as a president, you've shown us every single day you are incompetent and incapable of doing the job of being president. Right. And we can allow you to be here for four more years. Because right. you will incompletely kill us all. Right. Because a lot of people look at me real funny when I say this. Because I always tell people, like, even if Donald Trump wasn't the Republican running for president and still the Repu- a Republican still won president, the presidency, I am okay with a Republican being in office, just long as they know what they're doing. Like I said, I this, this whole Trump presidency has made me appreciate Bush's presidency so much. <laughs> and, and we all know how crazy that was. But it has made me appreciate exactly. it so much. Because there's a certain level of, there's a level of decorum. There's a level of intelligence. There's a strand of anti-intellectualism that is running rampantly through the Republican Party right now. Where it's smart to be, it's it's cool to be dumb, right? Like you like, oh, oh, I speak American. You speak American? <laughs> what language is American exactly? Made up. And the fact that you think, well, I spoke to the president of Puerto Rico. You're the president of Puerto Rico, right? Puerto Rico belongs to the United States. <laughs> oh my goodness! There's a certain level of an intellectual curiosity. And a thought process that you should have as the president of the United States. I'm pretty sure if we asked him a random question about anything other than, well, you, we know he knows who the president of Russia is. Uh, <laughs> but if we asked him any random question, he would probably look at you like, I don't know who that is. I've never met this person. Right. You're the president of the United States and you don't know who the chancellor of Germany is? Yeah. You don't have a, a, a speaking relationship with this person because every time you walk in the room, you misbehave. I think about this picture all the time when he's sitting there at the table with his arms crossed like he's six years old. <laughs> and all these world leaders are looking at him like, what is wrong with you? Right. They're laughing like, at us. You, people always say Americans are the stupid. We're the stupid country. Until 2016, I had a reason to fight back against that. Mm-hmm. Then Donald yeah. Trump came around, and he began to look and act like every stereotype the world has about the United States of America. Yeah, spoiled. <laughs> we look, we look spoiled, like spoiled, un- uninterested, incompetent. Uh, all, all we know is is blowing up things and partying. 
Right, cause I, cause I wanted to get on, cause like way how everything we open. I want, but I want to, I had wanted to talk to you about. Um, yeah. America was the only country that I noticed that were protesting for their country to reopen uh, during the whole pandemic. Like when I watched, even when I watched world news, I never saw anything about Europe or China or all these other places or Italy who were on lockdown way longer than the two months that we did where people started protesting. And, you know, I was just like, that's just make America look so spoiled. So I wanted to ask you about like, what, what do you think about that? It's not that it's not America. It's not America. It's particularly a subset of Americans mm-hmm. that are that show their privilege, right? And entitlement to I get to do what I want to, and I am free, and I am whatever it is I can do. I get to do it because I can do it, and there's nobody can stop me. Right. It's, like, it's the same way people say, "Oh, I have my guns, and I have my guns to protect me from the government." You have an M16 to protect you from the United States government. <laughs> Not how dumb you sound. The owner <laughs> of an F-16, a B-52, SEAL Team 6, but they're going to stop you. They're going to be stopped by you and your M-16 in your <laughs> suburban home. Right. Good luck with that. <laughs> I, I said the same were. thing. Let me know how that ends. I said the same thing. So I want to, cause so um, I want to ask you about because the assembly was the one who challenged the uh, the so I said the Republican assembly side was the ones who challenged Governor Evers stay at home, right? Yeah. So do you agree with the reop with them pushing to reopen so soon? No, not at all. I believe we should listen to the science, experts, and our public health experts, and we should know for certain what is best for the people of Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. You know, if we reopen the economy and everybody dies, when the economy collapses, does anybody, will anybody hear it? Right, that's true. We have to listen to the, listen to the smart people. They <laughs> generally know what they're doing. Because, <laughs> cause like, um, when, it, when the whole thing, I think, what was it, the week before the 26th, I don't remember what day, I think it was like a Thursday or Friday or, or Wednesday or something like that, things started to reopen and, and Governor Evers had lifted some of the orders. But right. within the two days of him lifting some of those orders, we had 500 people test positive for the coronavirus. Yeah. So because people don't take things seriously, right? Anymore. So that that makes me wonder: like, should we go back into a lockdown? Like, I don't think the whole lockdown shouldn't have been lifted at all yet. To be honest, it shouldn't have. And because I'm because really I look at states like you know like California and New York where I don't even know why New York is trying to even open up they just should just stop at this point but I'm looking at all these other other these these four what's the things like four other states that's still like under lockdown and I'm looking at them like why are we not doing that like forget I get the protesting and stuff but at the with the pro people are going to the state capitol and protesting and doing all these things and. I get it. You want people to shut up to get out your ear, basically. So you gonna open things back up, but then at the same time, like you need it's your job to protect the ones who want to stay safe. And I feel like at the moment we're not protected. I went to Johnson Creek uh, last week when I went up to Madison to drop off my signatures to get onto the ballot mm-hmm. on the on the way back from Madison, and we decided to stop. Me and my family decided to stop at the mall, and things are open. And there's see, nobody home. Yeah, and I see, and I'm well, now these places are going to be losing more money because mm-hmm. they brought their they're bringing some of their some some stores are open, some stores just said no, we're not open. Mm-hmm. But the stores that have come back, they have now they have the lights on and running again. They're running all the power, running all the air. They got the employees in, and they're spending money that they're not getting back. Mm-hmm. So now they're going to collapse, and then what? Yeah, because I'm one of those people where I'm I might go to the grocery store and that's about it. And like, like I keep saying like, oh, I want to go get my hair done so bad, get my dress and stuff retwisted. Because right now it's been like four months for me. But I'm like, I'm just so scared to go to like hair salons right now due to I'm steady seeing more and more t- people test positive. And then on yeah. top of that, I work in a hospital in the ICU all day, so I was I've yeah, seen a lot of stuff. <laughs> no, I don't do that. <laughs> See, yes, and I'm seeing a lot of stuff, so it's like it's it's hard for me to want to go out and you know and explore and be out in the public like that. But they're saying I just can't do it, and I was I'm I'm still here thinking like, what 
is it that they're not seeing, like government wise, especially the Republican Party, that they're not seeing about this? All they're seeing are dollar signs. The fact that the government, that the economy isn't open, people aren't making money, and the economy is going down. Forty million Americans have lost their jobs since this has started. The unemployment rate has gone from almost three percent to probably somewhere around fifteen or higher. Mm-hmm. We are in, we are we are in a second Great Depression right now. And then all of the all of the all of the papers are saying that. every everything we got that would be an indicator mm-hmm. of that is saying we are in a second Great Depression, and mm-hmm. they they want to say they want to say their asses frankly. Because when we get to November, Trump is going to fall, which is going to bring down Republicans in the Senate, Mm -hmm. which are going to bring down Republicans in the House, which are going to bring down Republicans around the country in all these different states. It'll look like 2008 again, which I'm perfectly fine with looking at like 2008. I'm I'm perfectly fine with that. Right. And that means we will have President Biden and whomever he chooses to be his vice president. We will have a Democratic Senate, a Democratic House, and Democratic governors and state legislatures around the country. And we can try to fix this problem. So I'm totally fine with that, which is why the Republicans want the economy back open so we can push people back out there to get to work. So we can try and turn this machine back on Mm -hmm. so so they don't hit the ground. They're not worried about everybody else. They're worried about them. Democrats, on the other hand, yeah, we... (laughs) We, we sitting here licking our chops because we enjoy the idea of what it will look like when we get rid of them all mm-hmm. at the same time. Right. Good policy and good politics. If we don't push everybody outside and kill them, they can actually vote in November. Mm-hmm. But if we do push them all outside and they all die, then nobody votes in November because we're all dead. I totally agree with that. I, I was I was going I was going to actually because I was going to say that like. People don't understand how important it is to have a House and Senate majority Democrat. Like, you, they don't understand the power that that has. Like, especially for these people who are relying on so much stuff from the government. And, you know, the middle class people, like, I keep on saying, like, the middle, like, the little middle class people I keep saying are left out. Like, we buy the products that keeps the rich rich, and yet we pay the taxes to keep the low class to be able to afford, to be able to sustain living. And I said and we, and they're constantly ignored. And I said by us having that 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 um that House and Senate Democrat all will help us out so much. Yeah, just think about think back to the the Obama the first term of President Obama mm-hmm. and his first two years. Look how many things came through in those first two years. We did the Recovery Act, which was the giant stimulus bill, which put money into roads and bridges and mm-hmm. creating those construction jobs. That bill alone was an entire administration's worth of work right there where we could have spent just, we could have just focused on making that bill successful Mm -hmm. and spending that money out the right way. Then you get healthcare reform. So now everybody has healthcare insurance and we're trying to expand it further. They wanted to do a public option then, but they didn't have the votes for it. Mm -hmm. But now we, the part everybody has moved to the position where yeah, a public option would have been better. Our bad. We messed up. We want to put a public <laughs> option in here so we can lower the cost curve and make not only Obamacare better, but we can make those private health care insurance prices go down as well. Nick, yeah, I'm a person who paid for private insurance. I'm so, it is ridiculous. <laughs> now, what if we had a public option? You could buy. So what, one thing that I support and is part of my agenda is after we. So my health care, my health care plan is a two step process. Take the Obamacare expansion. That's step one. Mm-hmm. Step two, create a public option here in the state of Wisconsin for Badger Care, where you can buy into Badger Care. And so, if people are buying on the Badger Care, it's forcing the private healthcare to look at the look at these prices. And go, well, we got to compete with this. Everybody's moving over there, but mm-hmm. they're, we can't compete with that. We have to lower our prices. And the reason a lot of that is is expensive as it is marketing and research mm-hmm. uh, development. Why are you you're selling? They have to sell health care insurance. They shouldn't have to sell health care right. insurance. Everybody needs health care insurance, but you're selling it. So you need marketing. You need to pay bonuses to your executive committee team to get them 
to stay on because it's private. You know, private industry they have bonuses for their executives. Right. They have you know, bonuses like that on on a federal, on a public dollar. You don't get bonuses like that. I know. I worked for the mayor's <laughs> office. There's no bonuses. There's no overtime. You get your you get your salary and that's your salary. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, like what well, for me? Yeah, like I know a lot of money that can go away from that. It's like for me, like. Uh, like I'm supposed to go to the doctor, I think like three to four times a year, or something like that. They say recommend, but I'm like, sometimes like I don't have, I don't want to pay thirty dollars every time for you to come in here and just to check my blood and blood, ple- blood pressure and then send me on my way, right. or every time I need right. my uh my inhaler refill, I gotta pay twenty bucks and I have to go to a certain place just only just have to pay the twenty bucks. If not, then it'll cost me more than right. twenty bucks per inhaler. So it's like, it's like it, I have. Why do you pay for an inhaler? This is something you need to live. It's like, why do I have to pay for an EpiPen? This is something I need to live. Why do people have to pay for HIV medications to stay alive? This is something you need to live. It. I understand we are in a capitalist free market society, but mm-hmm. come on, people. Like, people have to live. This is, you shouldn't die because you can't afford your medication. I agree with that. That's just it. Now, if you can pay, please pay. Help out the cause, but you will get your medication. Right. It's just, it, it's just it's unacceptable. Right. It's just unacceptable to be dying or rationing out their diabetic, their diabetes insulin and stuff like that. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I, and I appreciate what Colorado did, putting a cap on how much you can pay for insulin a mm. month in Colorado. I would like to see that done here in the state of Wisconsin. Oh, we definitely need that. And the other things from Colorado, I would like. I, though I am not a smoker myself, <laughs> that's not my thing. I think we should definitely legalize medical and recreational marijuana here in the state. Of Wisconsin. Wouldn't that be such a huge revenue for the state? Like, oh my Especially god, right if we now, had that, we gonna need it. Exactly. Now, I wouldn't say do it so much like Chicago did because the amount of tax that you pay in Chicago is a, like. I know a few people have driven down to Chicago just to buy some, and they have not been back since then, just because. They're paying like thirty dollars in taxes on top of whatever the price is for the product. So I don't think that's but, something you know, we necessarily sure go with that money. That money's going to schools and roads. Yeah, true. But you, you get what you pay for. Yeah, that is true. Because like even when I went to Colorado, you know, it was compared to Chicago prices. Colorado is, is still cheaper than Chicago. Colorado's a much smaller state. <laughs> But I, mean, I just, I, I just find that it just had blew my mind. I was just like, wow. But yeah, <laughs> but that's like I said, that's one of the things. Like I think that it would be a really good revenue for the state. Which I'm looking at them like, why aren't you passing this and see that these other states are having so much success from this being legal? Because there are because of who is in charge. <laughs> like I keep saying, like I'm not a smoker myself, but um, it's been times where I eat the candy. And, right. and you know, and, and like I said, like that just is a great revenue for the state. Why aren't we doing this? Right. So that's just common sense. My grandmother used to say it all the time: common sense and common. That is true. So, okay, I got a few more things, and then I'm, I'm gonna let you go. <laughs> go ahead. I'm having fun. Look, I talked all night. You done made a mistake. <laughs> How did I make the mistake? You, I will talk all night. I am I am from a family of Southern talkers. This is what we do. Well, if I have to make this a two part thing, then I just have to make it a two part episode where we like over a span of two weeks. So if I have to, I can do that. <laughs> hey, hey, your, your funeral uh, listeners. I hope y'all enjoy me. <laughs> <laughs> so, because one of the one things, so I want to talk about was um like even with the massive job losses that you had spoke on, so. <laughs> You know, with everybody being out of work and unemployment being up, and you know the bills are still piling up, what do you think we they could have done better to handle that situation? Um, they could have followed President Obama's plans. They could have actually acted upon it immediately when they found out that it had arrived in the United States, as opposed to mm-hmm. you know, him saying, "Oh, this is just a hoax." They're just doing this to get me. Mm-hmm. Don't nobody care about you. Mm-hmm. Nobody cares about you, Donald. Nobody. If you look at Melania, how she looks at you, clearly nobody cares <laughs> about you. Um, the thing is, you need to act. We could have acted earlier. 
Mm-hmm. We could have saved lives. We could have locked this thing down instead of constantly hesitating and waiting and waiting. Because at the there were things we could have done to be proactive instead right. of waiting and becoming reactive to a situation that was already in progress. Right. Cause and that would have saved a lot of jobs. That would have saved a lot of people. Right. Because one thing I did notice during this pandemic, a lot of government resources was wasted as far as money. Like the whole converting um, state fair things, talking because the news were, I believe the news the news kind of created a panic that they shouldn't have did. Because for me, because like I, I work I work in the ICU all day. I work in the hospital, and when there was like, oh, we you know the hospitals are just so overwhelmed, and we need to take all this money and convert state fair into a hospital. During this whole time they were talking about that, the hospital was empty. Like, the floor that I literally worked on had maybe six or seven patients on there at the most in a week. Wow. Even, and if, in, in, in most days, I would say it was about three or four patients on that floor that was that was converted into a COVID floor. So I was like, this... See, that, that was, that's the government being reactive. Yeah. Because if they had been proactive, they could have had everything in place already and been ready to go if something like this happens. When you react, you overreact. Yeah. Because now people are getting sick at this level over here. That means it's going to happen over here. So we need to just throw everything we can into it right now and get everything ready to go. But we don't necessarily have to go that far. Right. But if you had a re- if you had been proactive and had things prepared and ready to go, when this came, we'd have been right here. Mm-hmm. But instead, this came up and you ran like hell to do what you had to do. So you just made everything and you didn't need all of it. Right. So now we have all this site and all these hospitals, and I, I really hope we still don't need all of this stuff, but the way things are going, we are probably going to with the second wave come through, but but now we've been proactive. Now we have all these things set up and ready to go, so when the second wave comes through, and it's going to come through, because look at where we are right now, we will at least be ready. For me, I believe for, it's, I, for me, I believe it's too late. At this point, like with with everything they put in place, um, the way how the government responded, I think it's just been too late. And yeah. like I said, we are way over our head as far as this virus thing. And I feel like this because when I, I, I don't know, I can't remember the doctor named who uh, Trump uses as his advisor on this whole situation. Oh, uh, Fauci. Yeah, but when I agree with him that if if Trump would have acted faster, this could have been something we could tame. But now I feel like this yeah. is something that we're not going to be able to turn back from. And we will. I'm a naturally optimistic person. Mm-hmm. We'll get through this. Yeah, I feel like we'll, we'll get, get through this. We'll get through, we'll this. get through this smarter. Yeah, I feel like I, I feel like we'll get through this. But then at the same time, I feel like it's just like the way how it's like how it's been, the way how the government reacted to the whole situation. I be, I believe like. How like like even with the Spanish flu, you haven't heard about the Spanish flu in years, right? And that's because, because they it was it was they caught it and they treated it and it was done and you know it was done and over with. But like this, right. I think this is something that's gonna linger on for years on past. You know, like Spanish flu maybe lasted two years. I think this is, this is gonna weigh way be around way longer. Well, hopefully, you know, just just in just due to the advances in technology. This will be a two-year thing, hopefully. Um, if not, we got some. Like I said earlier, we got some difficult days ahead. Mm-hmm. But hopefully, things will. We are advanced enough at this point where we can catch it before it truly. Like it's already out the gate, but we can still catch it and put it back. Right. And that's the thing that I hope we can do. We can get a vaccine, or at least get a shot ready, and people who. People who do not believe in vaccinations, don't <laughs> vote for me. You're just stupid. You'll kill us all. But we can get a vaccine out so we can stop this from happening and continue to reoccur at this level. We may not, ne- we can't, we haven't cured the common cold. That's true. But we don't all die in mass from it. Right. We haven't cured the seasonal flu, but we know how to. We have a vaccine for it that you get a flu shot and you will, even if you do get the flu, it won't be at that level of severity. We've cured polio with the vaccine. We've cured measles and mm-hmm. smallpox, all these kind of things. Just take the vaccine. Stop it from happening. And even if you do end up getting it mm-hmm. or something like it, 
the severity level is just it's not going to kill you or maim you permanently a lot of people are afraid of that if they get the the vaccine for the coronavirus that they're going to get microchipped <laughs> yeah okay that's been the thing that I've been hearing. The vaccine ain't a microchip. <laughs> <laughs> and I keep saying it like they keep worrying about the government tracking. I'm like, I'm pretty sure if you have your location turned on on your phone, you're being tracked 24 seven. So <laughs> I, I love how important people think they are. <laughs> and if they, if the government really wanted you, remember, they found a six foot tall Arab man in Pakistan. Right. <laughs> you think if they want you. In the United States, they can't come and get you. <laughs> that is so. Oh, sorry, you're just not that important, sweetie. You're just not that important. That is, that is true. Because actually, when since you mentioned, mentioned uh, vaccines, as a kid, oh crap, I don't do something. As a kid, you know, I was one of those kids that got a vaccine, and um, it's crazy because back then, so I didn't know. So I had a an incident at work where I got poked by a needle that had blood in it from a patient. So, yeah. um. I ended up having to do like HIV testing and all this stuff. And it right. turns out that I basically got it vaccinated as a kid to where if I was to get poked by something like that's infected with HIV, like a needle or something, I'm immune to it now because I got these vaccines as a kid, <laughs> which I didn't even know was a thing. And here I am, I'm almost 30 and didn't even know that this was a thing. <laughs> Mind blown. <laughs> <laughs> It's just is medical technology has advanced right every every year there's some giant it's gonna kill us all we we act like the like the people who were worshiping the sun so it didn't explode and kill everybody we, the human race just we take step forward then we slide right back into where we originally started from that's just just is how we are 5g isn't going to kill you it is literally oh. the next generation of making cell phones better I'm so sick of hearing uh, people talking. People... I mean, I'm so sick of hearing about people. Uh, talk... I'm so sick of hearing about people talking about how 5G when they launch 5G is gonna give everybody cancer. Like, oh my goodness, this like this lady. Just like the light bulb. Yes. The light bulb is gonna kill us all too. So was the moving. So was the moving vehicle. Right. And so was the boat. And so was the airplane. <laughs> Everything is going to kill us. Right. If you notice, we're still here. Right. You want to be? You won't be afraid of something that's gonna kill you. Get out there and vote in November so we can get rid of Donald Trump. Get out there and vote so we can actually fight back against climate change by having a president who believes climate change is real. Right. That'll kill us. Five G ain't it? Right. It's so crazy because even with uh, climate change, I, <laughs> I was like, what? Because even over the last winter, like, we didn't get really a bad winter. It felt like the South was getting our winter, and then we was having their winter. I'm like, what is yeah. going on with this? Like, it's the it's like the equator flipping. So, it's the, it's, it's, it's the North Coast Star being there, tropical. Like, every, the whole world ended up being stuck in Wisconsin. Right. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's making me wonder, like, so is, is it going to flip? Like, is tropical going to be up north now, and the South is going to be, like, the cold? Like, what is going on <laughs> That's gonna mess up a lot of vacation plans. I tell you that much. I know it's already planned out. Bahamas a... will never be the same. <laughs> <laughs> I already planned out a cruise. I think two years from now already. So I'm hoping that I can do it. <laughs> you may, you may want to go go on an Alaskan cruise so you can see what you're about to get. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh my god. It was something. It was something in my notes that I had wanted to uh, ask you about, and I can't even remember, and I can't even find it in my notes. So now I'm upset. <laughs> oh, I know you had some probably some questions uh, LGBT related. Yeah, I'm going to get into that too. So I had looked oh, through. Yeah. You actually met Joe Biden. I yes. noticed. How is he in person? He is exactly who he is on TV. That is that man is. <laughs> so I I met him first time I met him. Uh, my partner and I at the time went to an event with Senator Baldwin. Mm-hmm. And we came up, and as soon as I walked in the room, I kind of just, oh, who, oh my God, it's Joe Biden. I'm, <laughs> I've been wanting to meet this man forever, la, 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 la. And just like, I'm like zoned out. I'm in the zone now at this point. And um, my partner goes up, and he's talking to him. He's like, well, who's this big guy? And I kind of just I kind of just go goofy. Like, oh, I can't, <laughs> hi. 
um, I'm the chair of the county party, and we talk, and he was just a really nice guy. He was really personable, really to talk to. Um, the second time I had a chance to meet him, um, he actually remembered me. Oh, really? Which threw me off completely. I'm like, oh my God, he remembers me. <laughs> and I was like, hey, how are you? He was like, yeah, I remember you were, you're Chris, right? You were the, you're the chair of the county party here. I am. I, I am, yes. And we talked, and he was like, you know, you got you got a big job ahead of you, because this was October of 2018. Mm-hmm. He's like, you got a big job ahead of you. You ready? You're kind of young. I don't know if you can handle this, but I think you'll be fine. I was young when I got elected to the Senate. And we just, like, had a a genuine conversation. Oh, wow. And then he went out there, he gave his speech, and he took off. And I was like, yeah, I got a big job, and I'm going to take care of it, because the vice president told me I got a big job, and he was young, and I was young, and so we're going to make this happen. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds and it, awesome. And he's a really good guy. And I, I look forward to meeting him again. I actually just, he did a virtual campaign rally here in Milwaukee. And got a chance to be part. So they had like the back. So normally at these campaign rallies, in person, normally they'll have the candidate come in, and they'll have all the the big fundraising people and the dignitaries and the governor and the mayor will all be back there and they'll get their handshake and the picture. Mm-hmm. So they did kind of that basically, but virtual. So they had all of us on a Zoom conference call, and then he popped up from his living room, like, "Hey, everybody!" And he's talked to each one of us individually, and. It was really cool. As a matter of fact, I invite, I told him when this is all free, we all free to run around the country and stuff. Uh, when he comes to Milwaukee, I am personally going to take him to Tasty Twist for ice cream. <laughs> and he said, yes. What? Yes, I would love to. <laughs> so I, I'm trying to, when the vice president, when president, vice president Biden or president B- Biden, when we get to that point, whenever it is, if we get here and Tasty Twist is open, I am taking Joe to Tasty Twist. We are getting ice cream. Oh man, that sounds like a plan. I'm, you heard it here first. It, Joe is gonna be on. It's crazy. <laughs> not Locus. It's on t- t- like Titonia and, and North Avenue. Like I think it's across there the street from go. the YMCA, right? Joe Biden's yeah. on Titonia and North Avenue. <laughs> it's it's crazy. I had got invited to. Uh, I got a text from somebody in his campaign to uh, to join that Zoom conference, but it was during my work hours. I was so upset. <laughs> Oh yeah, we were trying to get as many people as we could to get to the virtual to the virtual rally because it was supposed to be like a bit, just like a normal campaign rally, right? Just virtual, you can't, right? You still aren't traveling around just yet because I but think it's coming because I so think it had here. started at like I think it started like three thirty our time and then that's exactly the time I'll be clocking out and I'm I I'm just gonna be honest I'm I'm not I'm bad at multitasking so I don't do it while I'm driving so <laughs> yeah don't do that, don't do that. <laughs> I'm I'm very bad at that. <laughs> <laughs> so, speaking of, considering that this is Pride Month, well, not the time this is being recorded, but when this is aired, it's going to be at Pride during Pride Month. So, right. let's get into some Pride uh, festivities. So, okay. with Pride Fest being canceled, what do you think? Right. What are, What do you think? Some things that people can do to celebrate Pride Month. You got any advice for them out there? Oh, I don't know. Fly the flag. Fly that rainbow, fly that rainbow proud. You know, oh, you know. Mine's in front of my house. Are. Mine's in front of my house year round. It's a little small yeah, one. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Fly that flag. I got, I got mine right here <laughs> on the. Uh, oh, awesome! I, I and it. I got the uh, the black, the one with the black and brown stripe as well. But fly that flag. <laughs> be who you are. Love who you are. Accept who you are, and let's be out here. So. There's this is a group called LG LGBTQ plus Wisconsin, and they're thinking about doing a virtual drag show one weekend on their um in their group thing. So if you ever want to okay. join, <laughs> okay, tune in. So I'm, I'm heavily I'm heavily active in that group. They actually had a, a, a like a group chat thing right before we had started this. I didn't get a chance to pop in with them, but uh yeah, I think that's something we should check out. I actually started something, well, basically something exactly similar to that here in from Milwaukee. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was LGBT people of color. Mm. Because, you know, there's always, you know, sadly the community has its segmentation, mm-hmm. like any community. But we wanted to create a space for black and brown people who are LGBTQ+. Plus to have a space where they feel comfortable being themselves in this group. And 
it's on Facebook. We post stories in there. Uh, I we usually post a lot of different stories and stuff. People, we have funny memes and all that kind of stuff, just to have a space where we can all communicate and talk about things that are happening with it for us within our community mm-hmm. about our community. It's definitely something that you know um, me and another person created, mm-hmm. and she well she it was, so it's myself and I don't know if you know Solana Patterson Ramos. Uh, she's pretty actively involved in the community. So the two of us together created this and we've just kept it going. And it's about almost 400 or so members now. And it's oh, a wow. really good space resource. We post a lot of different articles from around the world, just mm-hmm. really focusing on LGBT, LGBT people of color. It's, yeah, it's so, so for, for me, like being out in public when in within the LGBT community, I kind of, I kind of shied away from that. Just for the last yeah. couple of years, it just seemed very catty, so I kind of, <laughs> I kind of shied away from that a little bit. But any anyway, um, I had one thing. So, what was like your experience like growing up? Like, when did you start identifying and know that you were gay? So, I was twelve years old when I realized I was gay. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, at that point, my family was going through a divorce, and I didn't feel it was the for me, I didn't feel this was the best time to really like, hey, well, I know y'all going through y'all thing right now, but I need your attention on me at this moment. So mm-hmm. I kept it to myself. Okay. And I really, I think for me, that was the best way to handle the situation. Uh, as I got older, I had people I could talk to, mm-hmm. friends that I could relate to, um, and it made it easier for me to come out and accept who I was. So by the time I went off to college, I finally came out. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a lot of people, I, it's, it's funny because when I did finally come out, I got gay bad. What? <laughs> and not in the way you would think. It was more of a, yeah, we know, Chris. <laughs> We've been through. I, my friend, my cousin, one of my cousins, one of my best friends, and she is my cousin, is like, yeah, I, I wish we had a better day. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm like, I'm sorry I'm not the gay you deserve. <laughs> I could try so much harder, but it's just terrible. <laughs> Oh, so every day, so they wanted the over the top. <laughs> right. I'm like, I just, this is not who I am. Right. I, I just can't, I can't give you the gay you deserve. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but my family has gotten over the fact that I'm not the gay they wanted. Um, they <laughs> have accepted me for being who I am. I've been very lucky, both of my parents. You know, of course, one of the big fears, of course, growing up is like, oh, my God, my parents are going to not accept me. They're going to throw me from the house. They're going to rip this shirt. I have no son. My parents have been very accepting Been very, uh, they met my former partner and I and they accepted us. We lived together and it was, it was wonderful. Um, I, I look forward to one day uh, having a family of my own. And having some people that? to give me more gray hair. <laughs> now, why would you want and to do such a thing? I don't know. I, I, obviously, I'm in politics, and I want to have a family. But, I'm a glutton for punishment. But kids are sticky. <laughs> they are sticky. They are very sticky. And I, I don't. Love that. I love it. <laughs> what? Because more than likely, you know what that means? They're sticky because they have the candy. <laughs> Think about it. Think about it. It be, it's crazy. <laughs> Adults aren't sticky because they don't have candy. You know, we we try to take care of our teeth. And Right, healthy, all that kind of stuff. And the kids like, Mm-mm, give me, my, give me my fruit snacks. It's crazy. It's and crazy because kids like me, but I don't like them. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> what it is about me that make kids like me, but they like me. I can't, like I don't like them. And everybody like, do you want kids? I'm like, no. <laughs> like, I, you know, I I always wanted to be. I always wanted to be a dad. Mm-hmm. Even when I was little, I was the first one to be like, we're going to play in the house. I want to be dead. I just enjoy, I'm, I'm a dad. I even got the dad vibe. <laughs> <laughs> so it just, I just wanted to be a dad. I think I, I like to take care of people. Mm-hmm. That's just what I do. I grew up with both my parents in the home. They were both very, you know, there's some people who say, well, he's gay. and Maybe he didn't have a, a strong father figure in his house. I 
dare you go and ask Christopher Walton Sr. <laughs> was he involved in my in raising me and growing up and everything? Uh, he is not gonna take that too lightly. I tell you that. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a strong father figure in the house. I had uncles growing up. I had aunts and a strong mother growing up. Um, mm-hmm. My mother is definitely the shit. If you wonder where I get my opinionatedness from, meet my mother. <laughs> oh, wow. If you wonder where I get my, <laughs> my ability to leap tall buildings in a single bound, meet my parents. <laughs> they are amazing people. Um, their parents, mm-hmm. I was the first kid. They made mistakes like every other parent. They made wonderful decisions like every other parent. They did what they could do. Right. And they gave me the ability to be here today and speak and talk to people and try to encourage them to do better. Because that's what my parents did for me. Oh, I'm I'm the third so, or fourth, so by the time they get to that third one, and they'd be like, "Who cares?" They stop caring. By the right, time... <laughs> y'all, look, y'all look difficult. Y'all kind of get left out of the cold. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I could <laughs> I could have been outside eating dirt, and they'd be like, "Oh, he'd be okay." <laughs> right. Remember when the first two ate dirt, and we we panicked, and they they didn't die. So I'm, I'm not even putting all the energy into this. I'm tired. <laughs> These kids wear me out. <laughs> right. So, for the younger generation who are who identifies LGBTQ, and they want to go into politics and all them kind of things, what advice would you give them? Do it. Do it. We need you. Now, a bit of word of advice, a little constructive criticism, you don't need an OnlyFans. <laughs> if you're going to be in politics... <laughs> <laughs> I recommend you leave that alone. Um, because these things will come back to bite you. Um, yeah. Mm-mm. The people uh, of Iowa will not take that too kindly. Yeah. It, especially considering everybody has uh, only fans now. Right. So don't, don't, let be, don't let Beyonce write you a check your ass can't cash. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I can't believe <laughs> Cause that just really tickled me. I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, that's, that's just real. I, well, thank you. People who know me know I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm gonna give you the straight and stinky. This is what it is. Oh my god! Well, you heard that. People do not do OnlyFans if you plan on going to politics. <laughs> <laughs> but it could work. You could end up being first lady. Oh yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. You well, won't be a Michelle, clearly, but. You won't be a Michelle or a Hillary or a relevant first lady, but you could be a first lady. I mean, you could look at Melania. She did Playboy or something, and she's first lady. <laughs> and post nude, and somehow. All right, so it, it, it can still happen. Yeah. Don't, don't. But you will not be happy. <laughs> you will have married badly at this point. <laughs> so, for, the, for those who are in, like, uh, in very difficult positions right now, like for so for so for people do ident- identify and they're in a living situation, especially considering that you don't have a lot of options right now and a lot of stuff is not open to go and escape. What are some things you think they can do to like trying to get their mind off of things and escape from their home situation? Because basically, they have to lie about who they are at the moment right now to keep a house over their head. So those who are in that situation, what are some things you think they can do? No. This goes back to, again, I've been lucky. I haven't had to live in a situation like that. Mm-hmm. Um, even, even though I was in the closet when I was younger, I didn't go through a lot of the things that a lot of people in our community have gone through because I don't exactly... I, I'm very I'm very under the radar, so mm-hmm. to speak. Not that I hide it, but I just don't radiate so right. to speak. This goes back to where I'm not the gay my family wanted. <laughs> uh, um, and you get a, you get somebody who, who does, who does live the radiant life that they are. Mm-hmm. It's hard. I can't imagine living in a world where my family didn't accept me. And I can't imagine being a parent and not accepting your child. This is mm-hmm. your child. You made this kid. Right. And yes, they are not going to be everything you imagined they would be. Mm-hmm. 
Because nobody could ever be everything our parents imagined us to be. I'd be six foot eight playing for the NBA. I'm six three and I can put a basketball into a hoop the size of the White House. <laughs> it's just it, we're not going to be everything our parents expected us to be. Right. But this is your child, and your child, who you created and raised, mm-hmm. loves something. Not the one you may have chosen, and even if they were straight. They probably still wouldn't be in love with the one you chose, but okay. they love somebody. And for you to reject them, you need to think about yourself on that. Check yourself. How would you feel if, when you came home, your parent or parents did not approve of the person you loved? You cannot help who you. Hell, if you could, half of us wouldn't be in the either. Uh, one half of us wouldn't be in the situation we are in. <laughs> the other half of us wouldn't even be here. That is, that is true. You cannot, you cannot help who you love. You can't. It's just not possible to help who you love. You love them because you love them, right. and you were meant to love them. Even with my, um, you can't reject somebody for that. Even with my current <laughs> partner, it's been times <laughs> where I've been. I, it's been times where I've questioned our relationship and it just right. like it, it's now to the point like i just can't help it <laughs> as much i tried to deny like even in the beginning stages of our relationship i tried to deny it so much and it's like i got to the point where i just couldn't deny it <laughs> like i'm hooked it makes me it makes me there's an older song that i think about um i used to listen to a lot when i first met my previous partner um uh, it's an older song it's could i could it be i'm falling in love mm-hmm it's the reason you're falling. You can't stop a fall. When you are going down, you are going down. You are yeah. Falling. And you, you can't you can't help it. So to all those kids out there listening, I will say this. You are loved. You are wanted. Though you may be in a situation right now where you cannot ex- fully express yourself the way you should and fully deserve to. Mm-hmm. The best is yet to come. You are not alone. Many of us have survived. And you too will survive. And this will only make you better because of your story. Diamonds don't appear. They're made, They're built under pressure. Right. This is your moment to be built under pressure and become the diamond you're supposed to be. And then your family will surprise you and be like, oh yeah, we already knew you were gay. We were just waiting on you to say something. <laughs> and then they'll be like, well, you're just not the gay we wanted you to be. You're just, you're just not. I'm sorry. And, and then you will get gay bashed for not being gay. <laughs> so, it, you know, you just, things are hard right now. Mm-hmm. You get it. Just hold on. Change is coming. You will be fine. You will, you will meet people that you never imagined you would meet. You will fall in love with somebody who will change your entire outlook on the world. And they will love you and only you. Just hold on. Just hold on. Ah, beautifully said. <laughs> that was very beautiful. Um, so speaking of, so that, I guess you said former partner. So that means are you single now? Yes. Oh, we got to find you somebody. If anybody, everybody out there that's going to listen to this, he is single. Y'all can find him on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn if, if, for the older people who know LinkedIn. Is. I, don't think, I don't think the younger people know about LinkedIn. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so he is single. I, I, am, I am single, but I am definitely communicating with about 57,000 people in the Wisconsin <laughs> 17th State Assembly District. And that is my priority right now is trying to get them to fall in love with me. And then after I have won this election, we can see who wants to be, we, you know, we can do a reality TV show. Who wants to be the next first, the, who wants to be the first gentleman of the 17th district or something. <laughs> um, right now, I am, I just, I, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm in love with my politics right now and I am working on it and I am trying to, if I can get the 17th district to marry me, then I can go ahead and find somebody to actually want to <laughs> do the full time job. Nicely said. But if life happens, because you can't help it when you fall in love, as I just said, 
if life happens and it happens, I'll yeah. I'll be there. It definitely happens. Like I, was, I can't believe like it's going on almost three years for me. I was like, how the heck did it get this far? But <laughs> well, it, oh, see, y'all, y'all got into a relationship around the time I got into my previous relationship. Yeah, I think it was around December twenty seventeen. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah my, previous, <laughs> my previous relationship, uh, we got started in April of twenty seventeen. April sixteenth, twenty seventeen. Oh wow! I don't, I don't remember the exact day. I'm bad at dates. I just remember the date, month, and uh, year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I remember history, history, history. Oh, history. Right. <laughs> <laughs> dates and times and places and months. That, that's my that's my wheelhouse. <laughs> All right. So before I let you go, I, I always want I always kind of tend to ask er, ask new people when I meet them. So. Okay. Oh, is this the lightning round? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, okay, no, it's, okay. it's real. It's real simple and fun. It's it just it just. What is your favorite error in LGBT history right now? Oof. <laughs> uh, you know, I definitely. I, ooh, the eighties was rough. Uh, <laughs> Very rough. The eighties was a little rough. We had some stuff going on. I don't know. I don't know. If I had to pick a particular era, I'd maybe pick the 2010s. I, that was such a decade that where things were, you know, they were still putting up those marriage equality bans and a lot of things were starting to change, but they hadn't quite changed just yet. Mm-hmm. But then all of a sudden, it, it had finally like rolled up as far as it was going to go, and then it just rolled right back down, and it's, just, <laughs> it's been going ever since. So, like, maybe like 2010, they did that last marriage equality ban. Mm-hmm. And then we got, like, Don't Ask, Don't Tell went down. Marriage equality started coming up all across the country. Pennsylvania, I remember it was like every week another state was falling in. It was like, boom, boom. Right. And all of a sudden, 2015 came, and it was like, yeah, everybody gets married. It was like Oprah was just talking about marriage. Right <laughs> <at that point. laughs> so, and and it has, it's been rolling still. And now we've kind of, we've gotten uh, HIV under control for the most part. There's still a lot of work we have to do. But we have medications now to prevent people from getting um uh, we have medicines like PrEP to prevent people from get, from mm-hmm. uh, getting HIV. People are living their lives again. I think I would have to go with the 2010s as probably the best modern era. You know, could be like we were back in Rome when everybody was like, oh, yeah, you can be gay. That's fine. I didn't even think about it. But uh, definitely 2010s, I would say, is the best time. Oh, and hopefully the 2020s will be even better. I'm hoping so. Yes. We just go close. We just go put pour concrete on top of twenty twenty. We just never <laughs> no, will no. come back to twenty. There was one good thing that happened in twenty twenty so far. We had a Milwaukee on win RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> Boom! Right. So right. there were one. Right. There was one good positive for us during this whole. <laughs> Congratulations to Jada as well. Yes. Congratulations. She was at Hamburger Mary last night, and I didn't even know she did a whole performance oh, yeah. and everything. Nice. And it was inside the club, but I didn't. I didn't even know like that was letting people inside the actual uh, dining area. So yeah, I didn't know anything about that. Yeah, I didn't even know she was here. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> I need to try and connect with her because that would be really big, especially with my camp. Because if, when I win, I'll be the first openly gay African American in the state legislature. Right. We need to make that I would happen. Love to connect with her and see, you know, how we can collaborate on some different things and issues that she would find important, and hopefully, she would support my campaign. Yeah, that'd be so awesome. Like I said, well, if you're listening, I'm looking for you. <laughs> <laughs> I I might know somebody who can make it happen. I'm gonna have to reach out to him. Okay. So yeah, I'm, I'm gonna reach out to him to see what happens. Okay. All right. So I'm gonna say thank you for being on my podcast. It's been amazing talking to you. Hopefully, the audience had a good chance to get to know you. And for the people listening in Wisconsin, go out and vote for Chris. Because it is, I'm telling you, we need to get this man in office, y'all. We need to get Chris Walton into office soon. Well, Chris, it'll say Christopher Walton on the board, on the ballot, just to let y'all know. So, it will say Chris Walton. Oh, it will say, say Chris? Chris okay, because okay, it will say Chris, because, like, like, you know, it's been sometimes when somebody wouldn't put their name on a ballot. It ain't what, they, what everybody know him as. Oh, no, it, it's Chris. Oh, okay. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't put, I didn't put Will Floyd on there. What? <laughs> You know, they had, a, they had a one name that we don't want nobody to really know your real name. That's right. your real government name. 
Now, my name is Christopher, but I always go by Chris. Okay. We'll say Chris Walton on your ballot on August 11th. So make sure you get out there and vote. Also, if you are interested, I'm sorry, I just stole your whole ending. Yeah, if you are right. interested in voting absentee, please go to myvote.wi.gov, and you can get an absentee ballot for the remaining two elections that are coming up this year. The presidential in November, me in August. Yeah, I need to do that because I was one of those dummies that was out there and had to go vote in person during that whole, oh my goodness. <laughs> I stood out there yeah, for was... I stood out there for two hours, two and a half hours. I stood out there. I got oh I started raining on me, and then after when the rain came down, it started hailing on me at the same time. And it, it was it was a disaster. I was soaking wet when I finally got in to go vote. I'm like, I, I was just so upset with that whole situation. <laughs> we we have been trying to get people to come out and vote doing the drive through voting as well, and. Oh, of course, we had like an actual week of in-person voting. Look, when they open up early vote this time, everybody, go. I get it. I feel your pain. <laughs> I love to go on election day, but this is why we have early vote. So we just go. I just normally, go and get it done with. I normally do early, early voting, but I was procrastinating. And then my work schedule, I'd be so tired someday. <laughs> so I was procrastinating because I, I kept on saying like, oh, I got time. I got time. But then they ended up canceling early voting. When I was going to go uh-huh. and do the early voting. Uh-huh. So, yeah, that's how I ended up having to go vote in person. Then it was too late for me to do the absentee ballot, which I got you just remind me. I need to go and still go online and sign up for mine. Sign up, sign up, and that way you don't have to worry about it. Your ballot will come right to your house, send it back. You will piss off Donald Trump because he doesn't want you <laughs> voting by mail, so it will have an extra bonus benefit of it. Just go ahead and get it done. So, the state assembly election is in August? Uh, the primary. Okay, the primary so is August. Primary okay. In August and that when, that's when I will win the Democratic nomination. Okay. No, then become the Democratic nominee for state representative. And, and then, then I will face November. off against a Republican in November. I ain't worried about him. <laughs> 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 but definitely, August is the big race for me. And then in November, we get the biggest race because that's when we get rid of Donald Trump. And I need all of us to show up. I agree with you. All right, so thank you so much for being on the, the podcast with me. It's been so great talking to you. Um, I learned. Absolutely. I have learned. For having me. You're welcome. I have learned so much about you in politics, and you make me want to get interested in more in history now because history was kind of my favorite subject in school at one point. But <laughs> come on, we got room. Ain't that many of them? Ain't that many black historians? We need all of we can get. So you got me interested now. <laughs> but thank you so much for coming on. Um, let everybody know what your social media accounts are. Sure. So uh, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, Walton for Wisconsin. That's Walton, W A L T O N F O R W I. That is the. That is how you find me on Instagram. That's how you find me on Twitter. That's how you find me on Facebook. And that is also my website, Walton for WI.com. Make sure y'all go follow him and make sure y'all go help him get these votes so we can get him in office, people. And, I need it. I need it. <laughs> and don't forget that you can follow the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can follow it on Facebook at, at Same Cast Different Day Podcast. And you can follow on Twitter and wait, Twitter and Instagram at, at SCDD Podcast. And if you have if you want to know any more information, you have questions for that you would like for me to send over to Chris. Uh, you can email us at scddpodcast at gmail.com or you can find them on social media yourself. So thank you for tuning in to this episode of Same Cast Different Day Podcast and I will see you, well hopefully y'all will listen next week. <laughs> Thanks everybody. <laughs>